Do you know the heart that the Father has for you? Can you begin to conceive the heart that the Father has for you? While you and I are still sinners, Christ died for us. I don't know if your father was abusive to you, if your father was a slave driver, if your father was a drill sergeant and a militant over-disciplinarian. I don't know if your father was utterly absent. I don't know anything about many of your fathers, but I know this father, he is a good father who loves you. He loves you. He loves you. His arms are wide open. He is running for some of you. And a holy collision is scheduled for this sermon today because you may have been running from the Father, seeking peace where it can't be found, seeking gratification and meaning in something less than He. And you've been running from God. You've been running from the Father. But today I pray that you turn your heart toward him, that you seek him with all of your heart, that you find him and you find him running toward you, pursuing you, seeking you, colliding with you, embracing you, kissing you, putting a robe on you, a ring on your finger and throwing a party in heaven above to the glory of Jesus that you and I get to be a part of because of the Father love for you do you have any inkling any concept any glimpse any notion any hint any idea of the father's heart for you it is given by the words of Jesus who would know the heart of the father better than the son himself and so whatever notions that you have about a father whatever you project onto God the father because of the mistakes of your father Allow Jesus to disabuse you of every last one of those notions by showing you the Father in the most popular and beloved parable of all. We have an opening text in Luke chapter 14, verse 25, on the cost of following Jesus. I believe that's intentional. I believe that's necessary for framing everything that follows. Jesus is going to give us a gut check. Do you know what it costs to follow Jesus? Do you know what it is to take up your cross every day and follow him? And then come three parables. The parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, the parable of the lost son. So we have an opening text on the cost of following Jesus and then the next three parables that immediately follow it show us how well worth it it is to follow Jesus, how the kingdom of God is worth absolutely every sacrifice we make, every sin we repent of. You will never regret repenting from sin. You will, in glory in heaven, not wish you could go back and sin more. You will not regret in the glory of heaven any dime that you gave to the advancement of the kingdom of God, and you will not regret in the kingdom of heaven any attempt that you made to scatter the seed of the gospel, not knowing the condition of the soil represented by the heart to whom you're speaking, you have no idea whether or not they're going to receive it. Even if they shoot you down, you will never regret getting shot down because of the kingdom of God. You will not regret getting looked over for a promotion because you identified with Christ in the most secular metropolitan area in the U.S. You will not regret helping those in need. You will not regret reaching out in Jesus' name. You will not regret changing your summer plans around ministry instead. You will not regret waking up on Sunday morning, braving the snow to bring your family to worship alongside your church family to hear other voices all proclaim the glory of God together. You will not regret one thing that you give, though following Jesus costs us everything. God has given us everything. Look at this QR code. This will give you access to the cross references that are available throughout the text. This is a link to the notes that you can use to follow along. And what you'll find is this week's curriculum, which is available free to you at redemptionwashington.com, is a Bible study that is designed to follow this sermon. And then every day of the week, there is teaching available from the Redemption Church. We provide daily devotions that also walk in lockstep with this verse by verse plan. We have a plan to go through every verse of the Bible together as a church. 
and we're about to hit the three-year mark of our 10-year plan, Redemption Church. Is that exciting? So cool, man. Every blessed and inspired verse. All scripture is breathed out by God. We align our student ministry, our adult small groups, our preaching plan, our daily devotions, all together as a church through the word of God. And so if you have a teenager, and that teenager is not involved in our church, bring them to my house at 6 p.m. on Wednesdays. We'll feed them, all right? We'll worship together. We'll go through the same Bible study that's available for you and for your small group that is written specifically to coincide with this sermon plan. Everything works together in lockstep, aligning everybody grade six through the cemetery of the Redemption Church. So we go through every verse together. That equips you, mom and dad, to disciple your children. Here is Luke chapter 14, verse 25. Now great crowds were traveling with him. So he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Yes, welcome to the Redemption Church. The sermon has begun. Wow. Jesse, did Jesus just tell us we got to hate mom and dad? And I, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure I saw the word wife in there. Like, I've got to, I've got to hate my wife. Is that what it says? Is that what yours says? It's shocking, isn't it? Look at that. It's written in the text. It's explicit. It's there. What does this mean? I gush over how much I love my bride to the point that it gets on her nerves sometimes. And I will just smooch every square inch of her face. And I call her beautiful lady when she answers the phone and I dip her and kiss her sometimes in public at Dave and Buster's for Asher's birthday, which embarrasses her. But I just love my wife so incredibly much. I love my kids. I cannot describe how immense the love that I have for my children is. You know this. How many of you guys are parents in the room? Raise your hand. All right. Do you know what I'm talking about? As soon as the, as soon as the baby's existence is known, something just changes, doesn't it? Something just changes, and immediately you're like, you mean more to me than I mean to me. And there's not a thing in the world I would not do for you. But the love that I have for my bride, gushing with inappropriate public displays of affection and all, the love that I have for my kids, it does not compare and it ought not compare to my relationship with God. The best thing I can do for my kids is have a great marriage. And the best thing I can do for my marriage is have an intimate, rapturous, all-consuming, breath-by-breath relationship with the creator of the universe. Because with that communion in the Holy Spirit, I know when I sin and I repent when I sin. I get my heart right with God and then I am fit to lead that fiery, brilliant, fearless missionary of a woman who's looking after our kids, two theaters over right now. And because my relationship with my bride is indestructible, we have a gospel covenant that covers my children and they are brought up looking at a demonstration of the gospel through their mom and through their dad. And none of that happens unless I am rapturously in love with God to the point that my love for God when compared to my love for my wife and for my kids, my family of origin, the love that I have for all the people in my life, it looks like hatred 
compared to the love that I have for God. Do you understand this teaching now, Redemption Church? If anyone wants to be a disciple of Jesus, you have to hate your own father and mother and wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life. Even his own life. If your whole world, if your whole plan, your finances and your calendar, your ambitions, your dreams, your hopes, if everything is built around the optimal you, this is popular in pop psychology today. These podcasts are listened to millions of times a day, every day, every week, every month. And if all of your whole world is about self-actualization, self-optimization, become the absolute best you and optimizing your life for yourself, and frankly, if it's just a slightly virtue-glossed version of hedonism, you want to be the best version of yourself so you can enjoy this life the most that you possibly can, you're not evidently fit to be a disciple of Jesus. Because what Jesus said is you must take up your own cross and come after him. Otherwise, you're not his disciple. And so it's the polar opposite of a life that is built around my own self-optimization and my own potential then doesn't even matter as much as the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God. Being a disciple of Jesus matters more than anything else. And I find that the more I am a disciple of Jesus, the better husband I am. And the more I'm a disciple of Jesus, the better father I am. And I can look at all my failures as a father, any failures as a husband, and I can trace those back to ways in which I failed to be a disciple of Jesus. Do you hear me, men? Yeah. All right, so your relationship with Jesus is the best thing for your marriage. I'm telling you, man, when I counsel couples, and they come in, they've got myriad issues, all right? But at the core of it all, what I have seen, what I've watched the Holy Spirit of God do is just clean the whole house up when the husband gets his heart right with God. It has this effect on the whole entire family. Now, wives, that doesn't mean that you're absolutely off the hook and you're utterly innocuous to the spiritual temperature of your home. Obviously, you're a Christian too. You walk with Jesus too. You're a disciple of Christ too. But I've seen this, men. I've seen it. When the husband gets his heart right with Jesus, repents from his sin and becomes rapturously in love with the Holy Spirit of God, it is a true, miraculous fix-all. In numerous instances, I cannot count the number of times this has happened, where the husband has just some secret sin, and when he repents of that, man, the Holy Spirit absolutely has his will done in that home, and amazing things happen. But you have to love Jesus more than you love yourself, more than you love your wife, more than you love your kids. And I know that that is a tall order, but that is what it takes to be a disciple of Jesus as per Jesus. Jesse, this costs a bit much. I don't know if I'm into this. I don't know if I'm willing to do that. I evidently love my wife more than you love your wife, Jesse, because I don't think I'm ready for something like that. I don't think it's right for Jesus to say that. Look at Jesus' own words. Verse 28, for which of you wanting to build a tower doesn't first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, after he's laid the foundation and cannot finish it, all the onlookers will begin to ridicule him saying, this man started to build a building and wasn't able to finish. There was a secret cigar compartment in the conference room at Lifeway Christian Resources. We kept dry erase markers on it, but it was the coolest dry erase marker storage bin you've ever seen. You would, somebody would just slyly walk up to the old school wooden paneling and bump it, it would pop open, and there sits the cigar shelf full of Expo dry erase markers, and then we would go to town. This was not on the top floor of Sullivan Tower, so named for the former president of Lifeway, who took an allegorical view of scripture. It was on the seventh out of 11 floors, but it was finished with the finest finishes of the 70s because in that day and age, that's all Lifeway could afford to complete in their own building. Now, go figure. This huge resurgence took place within the Southern Baptist Convention. Every church and missionary and seminary and all of Lifeway aligned with the simple idea of biblical inerrancy. That one thing aligned. Calvinists, Molinists, uh, Amoraldians, everybody, all rallied around that one singular truth. And then, go figure, 
Lifeways resources got way better and sales went up like a hockey stick. Seminary enrollment quintupled, giving to missions quintupled. It became the biggest Protestant denomination in the world when they rallied around biblical inerrancy. But while they built us our new building while I was writing and managing at Lifeway, we had to temporarily relocate to the old Sullivan Tower. And floor seven was the nicest floor because they literally didn't count the cost before they began construction. There's a building like this in Orlando as well. And every time we would take students from our church in Windermere surfing and uh, in Cocoa Beach, we would pass it and we would tell this parable every single time. What's funny too is that one's also owned by a Christian ministry. Why are Christians building incomplete skyscrapers? Like multiples of them. I can't name any incomplete non-Christian endeavors that led to skyscrapers. The only ones that I know off the top of my head were all begun by Christians who ought to have known better than anybody. You have to know what it's gonna cost you before you set out. It's going to cost you everything. It's gonna cost you your plans for your life. You confess that Jesus is Lord. That means that you're not Lord anymore. Have you counted the cost? Because you'll find that Christianity makes a horrible addendum onto your plans for your life. You'll find that Jesus is disruptive to your vision and your plans and what you had in mind for you and yourself. You'll find that the Bible is going to upend what you thought marriage was and how marriage actually works. You're gonna find that if you had a certain way of raising your kids based on books that you read, suddenly the authority of scripture comes to bear and you gotta make a decision between the word of the dude and the word of the Lord. It's gonna change things for you. It's gonna, it's gonna cost you your plans for your life. It's gonna affect your finances and your plans. It's gonna change the way that you treat your spouse. It's gonna change the way that you raise your kids. It's gonna change the way that you talk. It's gonna change the way that you conduct yourself at work. It's gonna change the reason that you have the vocation that you have. It's gonna change everything. It's gonna cost you your house. It's gonna be opened up and become a ministry context. It's gonna cost you your marriage. It's gonna become a demonstration of the gospel. It's gonna cost you your children. Suddenly you're a disciple maker. It's gonna cost you your job. Suddenly you've, you have a mission field and not just an occupation. It's gonna cost you everything. You die to yourself. That vision that you had of yourself as a kid, as the rock star, you have to slay it. You have to kill it. You have to nail it to a cross. And you pick that cross up every single day. You die to your old sinful self every single day. And you follow Jesus. It costs you everything. No sticker shock in this church when it comes to the gospel. It cost God his son. It cost Jesus his life. It's gonna cost you everything, every day. Take up an instrument of capital punishment, an instrument designed by the Romans for maximum pain and public execution for the worst offenders, and you willingly pick it up every day. That's what you do to your old self, your old ways, to your sin every single day, and you follow Jesus. Otherwise, you cannot be his disciples. Count the cost before you start building. We're gonna give an altar call at the end of this sermon. And before you walk the steps down, I want you to know it's gonna cost you everything. Verse 31, or what king going to war against another king will not first sit down and decide if he's able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000? It's just good sense. If not, while the other is still far off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. In the same way, therefore, every one of you who does not renounce all his possessions cannot be my disciple. Lay it all at the foot of the cross. Everything. Like my house, it's God's. My car, it's God's. All of it belongs to God. If he asks me for it, I sell it like that. He's currently using it four days a week for the Redemption Church. <laughs> and I see now why he gave us the incredible deal that he did on it. 
but it's his house, do you see? It's his, all of it's his. Okay, everything that I have, it's all his. I can do nothing apart from him. I'm wholly, utterly dependent on my Lord for every single breath that I take. Everything that I own, all of my possessions, they are all God's. They all belong to him. Would you let the Holy Spirit do an inventory with this verse in your heart right now? Because you can't continue. Okay, if there's something in your heart that you're like, nope, I'm not willing to give that possession up, then just head home and catch the rest of the sermon on video after church is over because none of it matters yet. All right, anything in your life that you wouldn't give to God if he asked you for it, that is actually a lowercase l Lord in your life. Surrender it all. Okay, he is Lord. And he's either Lord or he isn't. Do you understand Redemption Church? If he's Lord, it's all his. If there's anything you withhold from him, you're following something other than Jesus. Idolatry is so surreptitious and sneaky, isn't it? You can find yourself involuntarily committing idolatry when something else becomes more important to you than God. And you can test this in your heart right now by the power of the Holy Spirit's conviction and light of the word of God. If God were to ask you for anything in your life and you would hesitate to give it to him, check that right now. Check that right now. Otherwise, you cannot be a disciple of Jesus. Now, verse 34. Now, salt is good, but if salt should lose its taste, how will it be made salty? It isn't fit for the soil or for the manure pile. They throw it out. But anyone who has ears to hear, listen. We are to be salt and light in the world. We are the salt of the earth. And if salt isn't salty, what is it? It's just dust. It's just powder. If you had manure, for example, even in this example, in Luke's iteration of this teaching, it isn't fit for the soil or for the manure pile because it has the chance that it could even neutralize the phosphorus within the manure that's there. The manure would have otherwise been good for fertilizer, but when you put salt on the ground, it has a way of killing vegetation. What good is salt that isn't salty? What good is a Christian who doesn't do the will of God. You see, I've heard numerous explanations of this idea about salt losing its saltiness and what it's supposed to be, how salt preserves meats and stuff like that. No, the, the idea is salt that isn't salty is useless. And a Christian who's not doing the will of God is useless. It's just fit to be put out on the streets and trampled by men. Okay, so count the cost. It costs you everything. He's either Lord or he isn't. You've either surrendered or you haven't. And if you're unwilling to surrender, unwilling to give God your wife, your kids, your vocation, unwilling to give God all of your possessions, unwilling to follow Jesus, bring up the gospel, scatter the seed of the gospel, do the will of God, obey the great commission, give your life to him, what are you doing? What good are you? You're like salt that isn't salty. What's the point? What's the purpose? What's the meaning? You'll find so much more meaning and eternal significance in your life when you sacrifice it. You take up your cross, you follow Jesus, you commit to him. May we not lose our saltiness, Christians. May we not lose our saltiness. Now, all of this paves the way for this parade of parables, three of them to come. And the cost of following Jesus is heavy on our hearts, right? That text kicks my tail. Anybody else in the room feel like that text just kicked your tail? Welcome to the club, man. It's hard. It's hard. But look at what you get in return for your life. Taking up your cross. Following Jesus every single day. All the tax collectors and sinners were approaching to listen to him. Now, this is, this is pivotal. This is, this is important. This sets the tone for some of the, some of the commentary that's going to follow, right? That there are tax collectors who are hanging out. This needs no contextualization, right? If you happen to work for King County Collections, we're glad you're here, sort of. 
you get it better than anybody in this room. You know why people didn't like tax collectors, but there's a little piece of context that may help you especially understand this. If there were people from within the Jewish community who were collecting taxes on behalf of Rome, those taxes weren't going to Jerusalem. They weren't going to the rebuilding of Israel. They were going to the Roman Empire. And these were betrayers of their brethren. Matthew was one of these. He would collect taxes on behalf of Rome, taxing his fellow Jews to pay for those who ruled over them. And so they were especially despised. But the tax collectors are approaching and they're listening to Jesus. And it says sinners too. Now, I mean, everybody there but Jesus was a sinner. So what does this mean? I believe that it points out the fact that they are, they are known sinners. Okay, the difference between a sinner and a known sinner is that the sinner just hasn't gotten busted yet. Right? And nobody knows about it. I've asked our church and small groups this question multiple times, and I've been always, always overwhelmed by the number of responses that say yes, that if there's something in your past, something that you have done or something about you that is so humiliating that if it were to become public knowledge, you would feel the overwhelming urge to just end your life because the shame would be too much to bear. When I ask for a show of hands on that, nearly every hand goes up every single time. So what does that tell you? The difference between sinners is named in verse one of chapter 15 and everybody else is that the known sinners were already busted and their sin had become public knowledge. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every single one of us has. Every single one of us then is a sinner, but the people who had bad reputations because of their sin loved Jesus and they followed Jesus and they listened to Jesus. Now, what's so cool about that to me is that it's not like Jesus went soft on sin. Agreed? Like, it's, it's not like they followed Jesus because Jesus made no mention of repentance. It's not like they followed Jesus because he coddled them in their sin to the woman who was known throughout all of Samaria, it seems, her whole town, for her numerous escapades. To her, Jesus said, go and sin no more. All right, he would call sinners to repentance. Sinners loved Jesus and followed Jesus and listened to Jesus. And they weren't following Jesus because he coddled them in their sin. They followed Jesus because he's Lord. Verse two, and the Pharisees and scribes were complaining. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. What's so funny too is that the Pharisee who invited Jesus to a banquet at his, at his house was also a sinner. Look at the lack of self-awareness among the Pharisees. They are sinners who condemn Jesus for eating with sinners. Having been sinners themselves and having eaten with Jesus themselves. Right, as, the, as the militant, murderous crowd with stones in their hands close in on someone, every one of the people holding a stone has sin of his own, has sin of her own. You can think of this in modern terms, like these are people who had been canceled. Okay, They did something, and for that, they were publicly shamed. And this day and age, wow it is easier than ever to be shamed in front of more people than whoever knew anything good about you. The one thing they'll know about you and they'll know it forever and it's preserved permanently in this online record called the internet. Wow, today we have gotten really efficient at quickly, publicly shaming someone, even without context. You can shame someone who lives all the way over in Virginia. Have you ever met her? No, but I'm chiming in. These are people who had been canceled, people who, whose, whose dirty laundry had been aired. And the Pharisees had their own stuff, but they cloaked themselves in regalia and they cloaked themselves in righteousness and they condemned Jesus for welcoming the sinners and eating with them. So, verse three, 
he told them this parable, okay? See how important the word so is? Okay? That word so is built on the context of all of this stuff. So he told them this parable. What man among you who has a hundred sheep and loses one of them does not leave the 99 in the open field and go after the lost one until he finds it? When he has found it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and coming home, he calls his friends and neighbors together saying to them, rejoice with me because I have found my lost sheep. I tell you in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who don't need repentance. So this parable is misunderstood when it's divorced from verses one and two. If given only in isolation without the pericope, it sounds like, oh, there are righteous people who don't need repentance and that there's a bigger party in heaven when someone like me repents than there is when some of those righteous people who don't need repentance do their thing. See, when it's divorced from the context, that's why the word so is incredibly important in verse three. It's because the Pharisees had just condemned Jesus for eating with tax collectors and sinners. So Jesus tells this parable that there's more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who comes to repentance than 99 righteous people who don't need repentance. I don't want you to think that I'm editing the word of God. In fact, I'm doing the opposite. I'm trying to illuminate it for you using like a, a modern literary idea. Okay, that's why I put, I'm not trying to edit Jesus, but if, if someone were to say something similar today, they would use the scare quotes thing. Have you seen this? All right, righteous people who don't need repentance. <laughs> There's no such person, all right? There's no one who would stand before God and God's like, hey, look, I'll give you one last chance. I don't usually do this. It's appointed for man once to die and thereafter face judgment. But for the sake of Jesse's illustration, imagine that I'm giving you the chance right now. Do you want to repent? And the guy's like, nah, I'm good. I'll stand on this record. <laughs> there's, there's no one who doesn't need repentance. Pardon the double negative. There's, every one of us needs repentance. Every single one of us. Anyone who would claim you don't need repentance, okay, you hear me, Pope? Anyone who would claim he doesn't need repentance, you are the Pharisee for whom Jesus gave this parable. And you see the, again, the pastoral imagery, the shepherd imagery. Jesus is the chief shepherd. Pastor Mike and I are two of the under shepherds. It's all his flock. And so this is, this is amazing. That one who leaves the 99 in the context of this parable, that's one of those tax collectors, one of those sinners. Because you can see in this iteration of this particular teaching, the 99 whom he leaves behind are the 99 righteous ones. See that? 99, say these words with me, Redemption Church, and let's use scare quotes as we do. Ready? Righteous people, okay? He leaves the 99 righteous people to go after the one. So in this context, the one is the tax collector, the sinner. The shepherd is like, okay, if you guys are good, I'm gonna go after this one. Do you see? The parable of the lost sheep has multiple iterations. We see it as well in Matthew chapter 18. And it gives us an incredible picture about, again, the father's heart for children. Because when Jesus gave a similar parable in Matthew 18, he's holding a child. And he tells us that, we must become like one of these children to enter the kingdom of heaven. And the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. And in Matthew 19, it tells us that their angels are always looking to the Father. And it's not God's will that any of these little ones should be lost. He's giving the teaching about the 99 while he's holding a child in Matthew's gospel. And here, he gives a teaching about leaving the 99 sheep to go after the one right on the heels of the Pharisees condemning Jesus for sitting with sinners and tax collectors. Now look at verse eight. Here's another parable. Or what woman who has 10 silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? When she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together saying, rejoice with me because I have found the silver coin I lost. I tell you in the same way, 
there is joy and the presence of God's angels over one sinner who repents. Doesn't the notion of celebration in heaven just rivet you? I mean, you've been there for touchdown festivities. And if you, like me, are at church on Sunday and you miss part of the Seahawks game and you're driving home and you hear fireworks, you're like, you're giving away the game! Right? We know how to celebrate. I mean, the most American thing we do is 4th of July. Let's blow stuff up! It's what we do. <laughs> Let's overeat and blow things up! All right? Where's, where's Jake, our fireman? We pray for Jake on 4th of July. We pray for you, buddy. He's like, yeah, that's one of our busiest days of the year. <laughs> we know how to celebrate, man. We know how to celebrate. Can you just imagine? Just try. Try and fail, but try anyway to fathom the scale of a celebration in heaven. Because we get ecstatic when some colored gunpowder explodes in the air. Yes! And this is just like a quick explosion. It's just, it's a rocket made out of the same thing that holds your toilet paper roll together. That's all that really is. We're like, bah! I mean, that's, that's what makes us celebrate. That's what really gets us going. That and white people doing the Cupid shuffle. Yes! I know this dance. It tells me the steps. <laughs> They're in the lyrics. I can't fail. <laughs> what direction are we going? Oh, yeah, that's right. To the right, to the right, to the right, to the right. Man, if you have fireworks going off while the Cupid shuffle is happening, this may be the zenith of human celebration. But it doesn't begin to compare to the celebration that takes place in heaven. That there's celebration in heaven, and it's, it says that there's, there's more celebration, there's more celebration in heaven over one person repenting than all of these self-righteous people who think that they don't need repentance, all right? And I think that I've, I've heard this my whole life also applied in the sense that when you have the concept of what we call rededication, all right, it, it's sort of a thing that, that came up maybe in like in the 80s or 90s, and it's this idea that like I have been a Christian my whole life, but I'm just sort of living in rebellion. I'm being what they call a carnal Christian. That's just a Christian who's in Stupid disobedience and just like chomping down hard on Satan's bait every single time, knowingly, willingly disobeying God for like an entire season of your life. And then you rededicate yourself to the Lord. We haven't, we haven't done that at the Redemption Church. I think that it actually probably happens every week. All right, it happens every week, really, because we sin and we come before the Lord, we confess that sin, we restore that fellowship and that intimacy with the Holy Spirit. And that is a good and God-honoring thing. But there is especially celebration in heaven when a sinner repents, when someone gets saved. It's an incredible notion, too, because it brings into mind questions about the eternal perspective on the temporal. That God exists outside of time, and he beholds right there in his hands all of history. He's the beginning. He's the end. He's the alpha. He's the omega. Simultaneously, he sees everything that has been. He knows exactly what will be and what could have been. He's that sovereign. He's that omniscient. If he had no knowledge of what could have been, he would not be omniscient, but he is omniscient. So he has perfect knowledge. And in all of this, from outside of time, observing within time, there is celebration when the time passes. It's riveting, isn't it? Celebration in heaven. And there are degrees of celebration in heaven. This woman has lost her coin. So she lights a lamp. She sweeps the house and she searches carefully until she finds it. Okay, do you know this feeling? People who come to my house know this feeling because quite often our two Yorkies, Luna and Tula, if you don't know what a Yorkie is, it's basically a cat. And these dogs are so spoiled rotten. Even while my family was out on vacation, there are people from the church that would like come to our house and help feed our dogs. They have an automatic feeder and waterer, but they'd feed them anyway and walk them and just pay attention to them and just show them love and affection. That's how spoiled these dogs are. 
At night, these dogs will sleep at our feet, on our bed. They have their own bed. They don't use it. They sleep at our feet, on our bed. Okay? They look at us when they're ready for us to go to bed. <laughs> these are spoiled, rotten dogs. But every now and then, these two tiny Yorkies that would be a smack to some of the eagles that we see flying over Tiger Mountain, Okay, like that would be the second of three meals for some of those eagles that we see. They just sometimes get inspired. And, and Luna will say to herself, I am a predator. I need to run wild on Tiger Mountain. And so I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait for Brian and Debbie to open the door. And I'm just going to go! <laughs> in the pitch black of night, and by that I mean 4.30 p.m. this time of year, and just venture out into the woods full of predators. And then what ensues is a brief panic <laughs> that may be the last time we ever see Luna or Tulip. Right? They just go off. We have a little microchip implanted somewhere in their ears or something like that. I don't know how it works, though, so don't tell the dogs that but they just get inspired and they go and then like the kids will come out, Luna, Tula, and we're just searching and we're calling and we're thinking about like how we saw a bear last week. We see coyotes all the time. There are eagles, there are hawks, there are all sorts of things. These dogs are at the very bottom of the food chain and they have no hunting skills. And, and we start just thinking about like the moment that we have to break the news to Jesse. Like, and we, we, we live this experience multiple times. And then, inevitably, you hear the rustling in the evergreens, and the cute little Yorkie comes out. Autumn Grace has learned that if she says the word garden, that they will run to the fenced-in garden, because it has this big deer fence around it that we think will keep some predators out, and that way the dogs can have some outside time. And so Autumn Grace will say, garden, and then the Yorkies emerge from the woods victorious, having conquered all the wilderness in their own minds. And then, oh, okay, thank God. And then we bathe the stupid dogs, and they come right back inside. And there's that relief. The, you know, there's that angst, though, while you're searching. You know what I'm talking about? Right? Men, raise your hand if you do the same thing. You have a routine, okay? When you get up, when you stand up at a restaurant, get out of your car, whatever. All right? How many of you guys do phone, keys, wallet? Yes, I knew it. Everybody else does that, too. All right? Phone, keys, wallet. And then what, what happened this morning while we were getting ready, my bride needed to borrow my car, which also has a key to one of the storage closets that we get the equipment from. And somebody asked me if I have a key. I immediately went, <laughs> phone, keys, 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 keys. Ah! All right, and then the search begins. And then there's angst in the search because you're longing for the thing that you are seeking and you won't be satisfied until it's found. And when it's found, there's relief and there's celebration, right? This is a picture of what heaven feels like about some of the hearts in this room right now. There's that angst while the search is happening. The lamp is lit, we're sweeping the floor, turning the whole house upside down, looking for you. Look at how this is, this is a consistent theme among the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, the parable of the lost son. In the parable of the lost sheep, the shepherd goes looking for the sheep. In the parable of the lost coin, the woman is looking for the coin. In the parable of the lost son, spoiler, the father goes seeking after the lost son. God seeking the lost. And what's so cool about this, because you've lost something, doesn't that mean that it's actually yours? Do you follow me right now? He's seeking after you. You've always been his. You're just lost right now. And there's angst in the search and there's celebration at the arrival. And in Jesus' name, there will be a finding of the lost sheep. Jesus will come with you on his shoulders. There will be celebration. The woman will have found her coin. And she's going to have a party. I found my lost coin. Come celebrate with me. With that, look at the third parable. Verse 11. He also said, a man had two sons. 
The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate I have coming to me. So he distributed the assets to them. This was a shocking request. Look at this. Give me the share of the estate that I have coming to me. Now, at what point do you typically inherit what's coming to you upon your father's death? Do you see how this is insulting? <clears throat> can you die already so I can get your money? Or better yet, just give me your money. You know the money I'm going to get when you die? Give it to me. You see, this is a shocking request. This is a shocking request. So this man has, this man has two sons, and then the younger son is asking for his inheritance. There's a couple of reasons that this is the younger son in this parable. Okay, here's Deuteronomy 21, verse 17. He must acknowledge the firstborn, the son of the neglected wife, by giving him two shares of his estate, for, uh, for he is the first fruits of his virility. He has the rights of the firstborn. And so this means that the younger of the two sons, just building upon this teaching, upon this stipulation about actually a neglected wife in Deuteronomy 21, we can see that the firstborn son would actually inherit a double portion. So this means that the father would have had to administer now triple portions of inheritances. His older son would get two shares and this younger son would actually get half of what the older brother had. Now there's two reasons for that. There's two reasons you gotta understand that. One is that the firstborn son is gonna throw a hissy fit at the end of this parable. You already know that. But you may have overlooked the fact that the firstborn son who is pouting actually gets twice as much as his younger brother. Also, you're gonna see a chronology in soteriology here. Chronology is in the order of things. Soteriology is in the study of how people are saved. Over and over again, the chronology is given. Salvation is first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. This parable also paves the way for Gentile salvation because the chosen, the firstborn, this is the Jewish nation, right? This is the people of Israel. These are the Jews. But the same, remember who is present for this message? Sinners. Tax collectors, Gentiles, former snake worshipers, they're all there and they're going to be saved too. They're going to be equated to the younger son. Later they'll be equated to the engrafted branches. Israel is the chosen vine and then the Gentiles are the engrafted branches. This is the metaphor that Paul gives in Romans chapter 11. So remember that about the older son and about the two sons, a shocking request has been made. Now look at verse 13. Not many days later, the younger son gathered together all he had and traveled to a distant country where he squandered his estate in foolish living. After he had spent everything, a severe famine struck that country and he had nothing. So man, some, some stuff goes down between verses 13 and 14, doesn't it? Because he's, he's loaded with money that he didn't earn, that he shouldn't have had yet. But he just asked for it like a spoiled brat, and he got it. And then he goes and spends it all on foolish living. He squanders what his father had worked for and given to him after an inappropriate request. And then circumstances beyond his control just bring the party to an end. A severe famine strikes the land, the country that he's in, and he has nothing. He's gotten as far away as he can from his dad. Do you see this word right here? He goes to a distant country. He happens to go straight to where the famine's coming. But at the time on the journey, do you think he probably had some fun? But it was exciting in the meantime? All right, it always is. Otherwise, we wouldn't fall into temptation. After he had spent everything, a severe famine struck that country and he had nothing. Then he went to work for one of the citizens of the country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. All right, so likely in the context of this parable, it conveys this guy going to work, maybe moving away from Israel, perhaps to a Gentile nation and then going becoming a servant of a Gentile. Within Hebrew culture, pigs were the most disgusting creatures there were pigs and actually dogs <laughs> it's really funny because as americans we love our dogs and we eat a lot of pig but in this culture in the hebrew context 
to be around pigs, to have to feed pigs. They were forbidden under the Noahic covenant. They were considered unclean. They wouldn't be allowed on the menu until Paul's next letter to Theophilus, the events in the book of Acts. Verse 16, he longed to, he longed to eat his fill from the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one would give him anything. When he came to his senses, that's important, okay? When he came to his senses, he's already made an unreasonable request back there. He has squandered his estate. He's lived foolishly. He spent everything. And now he's come to his senses. All right, sin will do that after it's cost you everything. You come to your senses after it's cost you everything. Sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. Come to your senses now while you're still under the gracious patience of God and before it costs you your whole life. Come to your senses now. He said, how many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food and here I am dying of hunger. He's gone from being the privileged prince of the estate to now feeding pigs and not even getting any of the food meant for the pigs. No one's giving him anything. He is now, he's now realized that his father's hired workers have more than enough food to eat from the privileged prince to the utter outcast. This is what it means to come to your senses. You become suddenly quite aware of just how severe your sin is and how much it's cost you and how much it matters. He is utterly broken and humiliated. He is financially quite poor, but moreover, the point of the parable too is that he is broken in his spirit. He is contrite before his father. You see where this parable is going? This brokenness, this contrition over your sin, it is beautiful in God's sight. Not because God's a sadist who likes watching you feel bad, but because it's the moment that you finally get it. And your fellowship with God is no longer based on pretense and self-righteousness. Come to your senses. Become aware of how severe your sin actually is. Be broken over your sin. And then you experience something beautiful. Here's a quick glimpse. This guy is... He is starving, he is neglected, he can't even eat what the pigs eat, and he has now become tokas to numate, poor in spirit. Here's Matthew 5, three through six, some of the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. This guy has become tokas to numate. He is hungering physically and literally, and he longs for redemption. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the humble, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Raise your hand. If you long for righteousness, you will be filled. You will be filled. You will be filled. Now, back to the prodigal son, the lost son. I'll get up, go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired workers. So this is the whole speech that he has prepared. Okay, he has, he has written this whole spiel and he has rehearsed it as he's going along the way. See this? Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. What's so funny about worthiness is that it's totally irrelevant to sonship, isn't it? Isn't it irrelevant? Like, isn't like, any, kind of, any kind of adoption, who adopts a kid and says, you are worthy? Like, what, kind of, what kind of a jerk parent are you? <laughs> You're worthy of my presence. You're welcome. It's a big day for you. What does that say about all the other kids in the orphanage? They're not worthy of me. <laughs> Worthiness and sonship have nothing to do with one another. Man, something incredible happens like when a husband 
sees his wife pregnant for the first time. You know, when the belly begins to show, it's clear, it's not just a secret between you guys and your small group and your parents and your extended family, like now it's, it's, it's literally out there now, all right? Jessie was so funny, you could just tell, like the way that she carried Austin was one way, and then when she was pregnant with the twins, obviously that was different. And something about Asa, Asa, when she was pregnant with Asa, he was a 10-pounder, and he looked, her belly looked like, it was just like a perfect basketball, all right? And it was like, it was all, all out front. And so she still had a skinny waist, and so when you'd see her walking in front of you, you didn't know that she was pregnant. And then she would turn to the side and you'd be like, goo! <laughs> and when she was pregnant with Autumn Grace, everything was different. Everything was different. She said that like, having, she, having, having given birth to four boys, having a baby girl was totally different. Everything, physiologically, hormonally, it was all a completely different experience. There's something that happens when I just, the sight of my pregnant wife, which we only, by the way, recently crossed the threshold in the duration of our 15-year marriage, whereupon she has no longer been pregnant for most of our marriage. <laughs> we did the math, and you're like, pregnant for nine months or so. We've been married for so many years. They're like, yep, you've been pregnant most of our marriage. <laughs> and we finally are out of the woods there. Something happens in a man's heart. He sees. Right? Like that child is loved, is loved. That child, haven't even been able to see him or her yet. Some blurry, weird images on an ultrasound machine, which by the way, women, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna bust us men. We don't know what we're looking at on the ultrasound machine. Even the 3D one is still kind of weird. But every time a woman shows a 3D ultrasound photo to a bunch of women, they're all like, oh, we immediately understand this. We don't know how you do it. We don't actually get to see the child. We haven't even seen the child. The child has said, said, has said nothing. He has hit zero home runs. He has a terrible batting average. He has no job, does not contribute anything. In fact, he takes quite a bit. But he is loved, isn't he? Just instantly, permanently, irrevocably, forever loved, loved, loved. That's my child. I love him forever. She's my child. I love her forever. I haven't seen her. She hasn't said anything. She hasn't done anything. She's never given me a gift. I haven't even seen her eyes yet, but I will love her forever until the day that I die. And every day for eternity after that, I will love her because she's my child. Just because he's my child. There's no worthiness here. He was never worthy to begin with. Do you see? Worthiness and sonship, totally different things. You're not beloved by the Father because you're worthy. You're not, I'm not, we're not, we never will be. We are beloved by the Father because he is good and because of his grace. So remember the spiel that the prodigal son is rehearsed in verses 18 and 19. Here's verse 20. So he got up and went to his father. But while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran, threw his arms around his neck and kissed him. While the son was still a long way off, he saw his, he saw his son. God sees you while you're a long way off. Jesse, I've done a really good job of covering my tracks this week and I came into church and I took the coffee and then people ask me how I'm doing and I said, I'm doing great. But the truth is, Jesse, that like my old familiar sin is creeping back up and I'm kind of, I, and I'm, I'm feeling very anxious and depressed about it. I'm at a crisis. I feel guilty. I feel terrible. If I'm honest with you, I'm one of those carnal Christians. I'm one of those prodigal sons. This is me on the run right now. I'm watching you online right now, Jesse, because I can't bear to be seen in person at the church right now because I'm so deep in sin. I'm up to my neck and stuff that I know is wrong. He sees you. He sees you while you're a long way off. And the father ran, 
Fathers in this context, in this culture, they did not run. He's the boss man. He's got a staff, right? You've seen that multiple times in the text. You're going to see them throw a party. You saw the prodigal son refer to the hired workers. That's part of the, part of the whole reason of having hired workers. You don't have to run anywhere. Okay, when, when some, somebody needs to run somewhere, the father would just point. And like five guys would just run for him. But you can just see this man in his impressive robe lifting it up above the knees and just running. And imagine the shock on the look, the, the, the shock look on the faces of all the staff. He's, he's running. I didn't know he could do that. He doesn't run. Men of this stature do not run. We sadists invented jogging. He didn't run. Proverbs says that the wicked run while no one is chasing them. <laughs> so that might mean that jogging is a sin. Now I'm just trying to rationalize my encroaching return of my dad bod. <laughs> but the father ran. Why do, you, why do you run? It's urgent, right? I've got to get there. That is more important than my dignity. That's more important than where I am right now. I've got to run. This is urgent. This matters to me. I have to get there. He saw his boy from a long way off and he ran. Now what happens upon the, the holy collision? It says that he is, what, what, what is the descriptor given in verse 20, Redemption Church? He's filled with, say it with me, compassion. If you are up to your neck in sin and you think that you are utterly disgusting in God's sight and you're no longer worthy of his love or salvation and you're thinking of yourself no longer worthy, you were never worthy to begin with. He is filled with compassion as we confess our sin and we come home. This is what is in the heart of the Father. It is compassion. It is filled with compassion. And the Father runs. And he threw his arms around his neck and he kissed him. This is a greeting that is reserved for utmost intimacy and closeness. He is filled with compassion for his filthy, beloved, wayward boy. There are no questions about where he has been or what he has done because none of that matters anymore. My boy is home. And so the father runs to the son. The shepherd carries the sheep. He goes out looking for it. The woman searches for the coin. The father runs to his boy and God is seeking you. See how this makes Christianity the converse of every legalistic religion in the world? If you do these things, you will earn your way to God. There's no such way to earn a path to God. In Christianity, God seeks you. The Holy Spirit draws upon you. God runs to his wayward children. He seeks you at your lowest and the moment you turn toward his house, you see that he's been out on compassionate patrol for you. And when you turn toward his house, while you're still a long way off, the father runs to you. He is filled with compassion for you. He will throw his arms around your neck. He will kiss you because you are his child. Here's Deuteronomy 4, 29. But from there, you will search for the Lord your God and you will find him when you seek him with all your heart and say it with me, Redemption Church, all your soul. Prodigals, wayward, lost, carnal. Would you turn toward the Father's house? 
would you seek him? And would you seek him with absolutely all of your heart? First Timothy chapter two, verses three and four. This is good and pleases God our savior who wants everyone to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. This is what the father desires. This is what the father will do. We will all experience something like this reunion with the father by the prodigal son in Revelation twenty two seventeen. Both the spirit and the bride say, come, let anyone who hears say, come, let the one who is thirsty, come, let the one who desires take the water of life freely. Would you come to the father? The son said to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father told his servants, quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and slaughter it. And let's celebrate with a feast because this son of mine, see that, was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Did you notice that the prodigal son didn't make it through his speech? He didn't make it all the way through. He didn't finish what he had to say. He doesn't make it all the way up to the whole request for a job. He just says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. That's in verse 21. But we can see earlier in the text that he had more to say. Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired workers. See that? There's more to the text here. In verse 19, he didn't get to it. He didn't have the chance to because he was interrupted by the father who said, quick, quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet. Slaughter the fattened calf. This son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he's found. So they began to celebrate. But not everybody is celebrating. Prepare to see the other side of this story. Some people liked it better when you were broken and lost. Some people prefer you the old way. They'd rather you go back out there. All right, we saw this in verses one and two of this text. All the tax collectors and sinners were approaching to listen to him and the Pharisees and scribes were complaining, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Do you see why I put these texts together? You've got the older son present in the audience while the parable of the lost son is issued. It totally reframes that iteration of the parable of leaving the 99 sheep to go after the one sinner. And it totally reframes our understanding about the older son and who he is in this text. Now his older son was in the field. As he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he summoned one of the servants, questioning what these things meant. Your brother is here, he told him, and your father has slaughtered the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. There's nowhere safer to be, nowhere better to be than back in the will of God. It's beautiful. Then he became angry and didn't want to go in. So his father came out and pleaded with him. But he replied to his father, look, I've been slaving many years for you and I've never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me a goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your assets with prostitutes, you slaughtered the fattened calf for him. Son, he said to him, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. That's the second time that's been articulated, isn't it? He was dead, but now he's alive. He was lost, but now he's found. That heart, that resentful, contemptuous, ungrateful, snobby, entitled heart is alive and well. In one sense, it would refer to the absolute hatred that the Jews had for the notion that the Gentiles could be saved. In that regard, the first son is the chosen nation of Israel and the second son is the Gentile nations. Just by mentioning this in a single breath, the entire panel adjudicating Paul would be with him every word that he said until he said that God would save the Gentiles. Then they try to tear him apart and they say he's not fit to live. 
So that hatred, that contempt, some of it is expressed by the Jewish hatred for the Gentiles, the resentment for the fact that they would live their whole lives obeying the Mosaic law. And now all of a sudden these Gentiles who never obeyed any of those laws, they can be saved. They're sons of God too. They're equally justified before God too now. There's contempt there. But that same thought is well within culture today. Have you heard the classic near trite critique of the gospel that says, I just don't believe because I object to the idea that a woman who spends her entire life feeding the hungry and the poor would die without Jesus and go to hell. And then the mass murderer who with his very last breath confesses Jesus is saved. I don't believe. I don't believe because of that. This is, this is so trite. I've, I've heard it in multiple iterations, and you may hear it as well. It's an objection to the gospel that shares the gospel, by the way. You can't make that argument without expressing the gospel. Okay, you can't miss the beauty of the fact that this man has committed mass murder with his dying breath. He confesses Jesus as Lord, and he's saved. That's actually quite beautiful. There's grace there. And the other thing that it presupposes is actually a huge lack of self-awareness and a legalistic faith that this woman's feeding of the hungry saved her and that she were sinless somehow. This is the same heart of the older brother. It's the classic argument that cannot be made without sharing the beauty of the gospel and it cannot be made without presupposing a gobsmacking lack of self-awareness for one's own egregious God-offending sin. It is the putrid lamentation of the older son in this parable and it's alive and well in our culture today. But the father's, the father's response is perfect. We are never more stupidly arrogant and ungrateful and deluded than when we resent the forgiveness of others when we resent that someone else would be forgiven. We are the older son. We are Jonah, the worst of all the prophets. Are you ready for that? Do you see your reflection in the older son? Just take a moment before we close because if you are perfectly okay with God forgiving you for every last one of your sins, you're perfectly okay with being atoned for in every last one of your sins, but you resent the fact that someone else would repent and be saved. Check your heart. You're the older son in this parable. We are praying for revival at Redemption Church. Amen? Good. Are you ready to see abortionists saved? Are you prepared to see doctors who have mutilated the bodies of mentally ill teenagers who don't know what gender they are? Are you ready for for them to be saved? Are you ready for the people who have insulted your children because of our gospel that we believe? Are you prepared for them to be saved and join the parade of sinners into heaven right alongside you? Are you ready for your own persecutors to be saved? If you have an attitude toward them, you look at the city of Seattle, the most lost metropolitan area in the U.S., according to the Seattle Times, this week, if you look at all of them and you think you guys can all just go to hell, I'm going to be saved. You are the older son in this parable. Are you ready for the people who get on your nerves to be saved, equal standing before God with you, just as forgiven, just as atoned for, forevermore, their sin thrown as far as the east is from the west, drowned in the depths of the sea, counted against them never again by the same God who's atoned for you. If you have any hesitation at all, about seeing the people of Seattle who have done egregious things that you consider worse than your own sins if you're not prepared for them to join you in the parade of sinners that enters glory one day, check your heart. You're the older brother in this parable. But I want to bring all of these parables together right now because I believe that the Father is running toward people in this room and online right now. Now the Holy Spirit of God has laid it on my heart. I took Asher and his friend to see a movie for his birthday. We came to the AMC Factoria 8 Theater. We got seated in Theater 8. The boys picked seats. I ended up in Pastor Mike's seat. You've been prayed for, Pastor Mike. 
And so I had quite an experience. I was praying for the service. I was praying for Pastor Mike. I was praying for his bride, Barbara. I was praying for the worship team. I was praying for everybody who was in the theater with us. We were watching Dune 2. It's a really good movie. It's really cool. I was praying for revival, looking at giant worms, praying for worship, watching people do weird stuff that's not possible. Epic movie, crazy sandstorm. Saw people kissing. I'm like, this is a church. Stop doing that. And like praying for people to be saved and praying and praying and praying from Pastor Mike's seat just, just the day before yesterday. And I just felt the Holy Spirit of God laid on my heart. Yes, Jesse, I'm going to do all of that. This text was chosen for this theater and this day and you were seated in this seat for this reason to pray for this. I believe that the Father is running after people in this room right now. Would you stand with us as we close? The Father sees you from a long way off. We have talked about the cost of following Jesus. And so if you are prepared to take up your cross, to follow Jesus, to repent from sin, to give him your very life, look at what you get in return, the loving embrace of the Father. He seeks you. There is angst in the seeking, but there is perfect peace in the foreknowledge of every decision that would be made. I believe that the Father is running after people right now. If the Father is running after you, if you feel like God has been drawing on your heart, would you raise your hand for me? Praise God. Praise God. Celebrate that redemption, church. That's amazing. Let's pray right now. God, I want to pray on behalf of everyone who believes that your spirit's running after them, God. I lift up those who are Christians who have just been caught up in stuff. And God, you see us. You see us when we're a long way off. You run toward us. Your heart is filled with compassion for us. You take sin so seriously, it costs the life of your son. But there is compassion in the heart of the Father who runs towards us. I pray that right now, by the power of the Holy Spirit, you would run, you would collide, you would embrace, you would kiss those who know you've called them home again. And right now, Lord, I lift up every everyone in this room for whom this parable became a testimony. God, I want to pray on behalf of the wayward lost who are going to be saved today, right here and now. If that's you, pray with me right now. God, I have been so wayward and God, I have run from you. But today, I'm turning toward your house. I believe by the spirit of God that the father is running after me, is filled with compassion for a sinner like me. This embrace of the Holy Spirit of God, this kiss from heaven above has transformed me. And by the Holy Spirit of God, I confess the truth that Jesus is Lord. Redemption Church, would you shout it? Jesus is Lord, shout it. Jesus is Lord. I believe in my heart that the Father has run, has embraced, has kissed, has saved me. A prodigal no more. I am home. I am saved in Jesus' name forevermore. Amen.